universal outburst till the famous sanitary flower sack came our way. Its history is peculiar and interesting. A former schoolmate of mine by the name of Raoul Gridley was living in the little city of Austin in the Reese River country at this time and was the Democratic candidate for mayor. He and the Republican candidate made an agreement that the defeated man should be publicly presented with a 50-pound sack of flour by the successful one and should carry it home on his shoulder. Greedley was defeated. The new mayor gave him the sack of flour and he shouldered it and carried it a mile or two from Lower Austin to his home in Upper Austin, attended by a band of music and the whole population. Arrived there, he said he did not need the flour and asked what the people thought he had better do with it. A voice said, Sell it to the highest bidder for the benefit of the sanitary fund. The suggestion was greeted with a round of applause, and Gridley mounted a dry goods box and assumed the role of auctioneer. The birds went higher and higher as the sympathies, as the sympathies of the pioneers awoke and expanded, till at last the sack was knocked down to a millman at $250 and his check taken. He was asked where he would have the flower delivered, and he said, nowhere, sell it again. Now the cheers went up royally, and the multitude were fairly in the spirit of the thing. So Gridley stood there and shouted and perspired till the sun went down. And when the crowd dispersed, he had sold the sack to 300 different people and had taken in $8,000 in gold, and still the flour sack was in his possession. The news came to Virginia and a telegram went back. Fetch along your flour sack. Thirty-six hours afterward, Gridley arrived and an afternoon mass meeting was held in the opera house and the auction began. But the sack had come sooner than it was expected. The people were not thoroughly aroused and the sale dragged. At nightfall, only $5,000 had been secured and there was a crestfallen feeling in the community. However, there was no disposition to let the matter rest here and acknowledge vanquishment at the hands of the village of Austin. Till late in the night, the principal citizens were at work arranging the morrow's campaign, and when they went to bed, they had no fears for the result. At eleven the next morning, a procession of open carriages attended by clamorous bands of music and adorned with a moving display of flags filed along C Street and was soon in danger of blockade by a huzzaying multitude of citizens. In the first carriage sat Gridley with the flower sack in prominent view, the latter splendid with bright paint and gilt lettering. Also in the same carriage sat the mayor and the recorder. The other carriages contained the common council, the editors and reporters, and other people of imposing consequence. The crowd pressed to the corner of C and Taylor Streets, expecting the sale to begin there, but they were disappointed and also unspeakably surprised. For the cavalcade moved on as if Virginia had ceased to be of importance and took its way over the divide toward the, toward the small town of Gold Hill. Telegrams had gone ahead to Gold Hill. Silver City and Dayton and those communities, communities were in fe at fever heat and rife for the conflict. It was a very hot day and wonderfully dusty. At the end of a short half hour, we descended into, into Gold Hill with drums beating and colors flying and enveloped in imposing clouds of dust. The whole population, men, women, children, and children, Chinamen and Indians, were massed in the main street. All the flags in town were at the masthead, and the blare of the bands was drowned in cheers. Gridley took up and asked who would make the first bid for the National Sanitary Flower Sack. General W. said, The Yellow Jacket Silver Mining Company offers a thousand dollars coin. A tempest of applause followed. A telegram carried the news to Virginia, and fifteen minutes afterward that city's population was massed in the streets, devouring the tidings. 
for it was part of the program that the bulletin boards should do a good work that day. Every few minutes a new dispatch was bulletined from Gold Hill, and still the excitement grew. Telegrams began to return to us from Virginia, beseeching Gridley to bring back the flour sack, but such was not the plan of the campaign. At the end of an hour, Gold Hill's small population had paid a figure for the flour sack that awoke all the enthusiasm of Virginia when the grand total was displayed upon the bulletin boards. Then the Gridley cavalcade moved on, a giant refreshed with new lager beer and plenty of it, for the people brought it to the carriages without waiting to measure it. And within three hours more of the expedition had carried Silver City and Dayton by storm and was on its way back, covered with glory. Every move had, didn't, had been telegraphed and bulletined, and as the procession entered Virginia and filed down C Street at half past eight in the evening, the town was abroad in the thoroughfares, torches were glaring, flags flying, bands playing, cheer on cheer cleaving the air, and the city ready to surrender at discretion. The auction began. Every bid was greeted with bursts of applause. And at the end of two hours and a half, a population of 15,000 souls had paid in coin for a 50-pound sack of flour, <coughs> a sum equal to $40,000 in greenbacks. It was at a rate in the neighborhood of $3 for each man, woman, and child of the population. The grand total would have been twice as large but the streets were very narrow, and hundreds who wanted to bid could not get within a block of the stand, and could not make themselves heard. These grew tired of waiting, and many of them went home long before the auction was over. This was the greatest day Virginia ever saw, perhaps. Gridley sold the sack in Carson City and several California towns, also in San Francisco. Then he took it east and sold it in one or two Atlantic cities, I, I think. I'm not sure of that, but I know that he finally carried it to St. Louis, where a monster sanitary fair was being held. And after selling it there for a large sum and helping on the enthusiasm by displaying the portly silver bricks which Nevada's donation had produced, he had the flour baked up into small cakes and retailed them at high prices. It was estimated that when the flour sacks mission was ended, it had been sold for a grand total of $150,000 in greenbacks. This is probably the only instance on record where common family flour brought $3,000 a pound in the public market. It is due to Mr. Gridley's memory to mention that the expenses of his sanitary flour sack expedition of 15,000 miles going and returning were paid in large part, if not entirely, out of his own pocket. The time he gave to it was not less than three months. Mr. Gridley was a soldier in the Mexican War and a pioneer Californian. He died at Stockton, California in December 1870, greatly regretted. Chapter 46 The Nabobs of Those Days John Smith is a traveler. Sudden wealth. A $60,000 horse. A smart telegraph operator. A nabob in New York City. Charters an omnibus. Walk in, it's all free. You can't pay a cent. Hold on, driver. I weaken. Sociability of New Yorkers. There were nabobs in those cities, in the flush times, I mean. Every rich strike in the mines created one or two. I call to mind several of these. They were careless, easy-going fellows as a general thing, and the community at large was as much benefited by their riches as they were themselves, possibly more in some cases. Two cousins, teamsters, did some hauling for a man and had to take a small segregated portion of a silver mine in lieu of $300 cash. They gave an outsider a third to open the mine and they went on teaming. 
but not long. Ten months afterward, the mine was out of debt and paying each owner 8000 to 10000 a month, say 100000 a year. One of the earliest nabobs that Nevada was delivered of wore $6,000 worth of diamonds in his bosom and swore he was unhappy because he could not spend his money as fast as he made it. Another Nevada nabob boasted an income that often reached $16,000 a month, and he used to love to tell how he had worked in the very mine that yielded it for $5 a day when he first came to the country. The silver and sagebrush state has knowledge of another of these pets of fortune, lifted from actual poverty to affluence almost in a single night, who is able to offer $100,000 for a position of high official distinction shortly afterward, and did offer it, but failed to get it, his politics not being as sound as his bank account. <coughs> then there was John Smith. He was a good, honest, kind-hearted soul, born and reared in the lower ranks of life and miraculously ignorant. He drove a team and owned a small ranch, a ranch that paid him a comfortable living. For although it yielded but little hay, what little it did yield was worth from 250 to $300 in gold per ton in the market. Presently, Smith traded a few acres of the ranch for a small, undeveloped silver mine.